What an intro. Hello, everybody. I am Joe Hollywood, and I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew Walker. Yes, hello, hello, everybody. And this is the inaugural episode of Hollywood Blockbusters, a brand new podcast for yes. movie buffs, by movie buffs. Ask not what your movies can do for you, but what you can do for your movies. movies. Fantastic. Famously said by RFK. <laughs> JFK. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Joe, I believe you. I never. That's a walk-off home run on the intro. Right there. <laughs> it kind of gives me the vibes of the old uh, golden age yes. movie from here, is at Grauman's Chinese Theater, you yep. know. Um, and really, that's kind of the point of this this whole podcast is uh, we're going to talk about modern movies, classic movies, and uh, just basically share our love and passion uh, for our movies. And and hopefully, listeners out there will find us. Uh, who also share that same passion, and uh, I'm really excited about this new venture. Absolutely, Me and too. again, I can't yeah. emphasize this enough, people, a treasure trove of Hollywood and L.A. secrecies sitting right opposite to us. That's Joe with the controls. <laughs> right. This man knows things. He knows things. Now, let's give the listeners a little bit of a background. Now, I I practically grew up in the movie theater. Um, when I was, Some of my earliest memories... I was going to the drive-in, and I may have mentioned this in the past, that um, some of the earliest movies I have memories of seeing included The Godfather, Diamonds Are Forever, the James Bond film, and then, you know, a couple Disney things here and there. But, you know, I I recently looked it up. Godfather came out in 1972. So I was six (laughs) years old. Six years old, and I saw The Godfather at the drive-in, and I remember the horses had. I I was going to say, what was your what was your gut reaction to that? That like stuck with me. That gave me (laughs) nightmares. So that's that's why to this day you do not like horror films. (laughs) (laughs) That might be it. And that's why we have ratings, Joe. That's (laughs) not suggestions. That came later, but. Well, I, I had parental guidance. They were just misguided. Yes. Um, so then later on, uh, you know, a cheap form of entertainment when I was a kid was the dollar theaters, which have pretty much disappeared from yeah. the landscape. Yeah. That's sad. Um, but my mom would take us to the dollar th- theaters almost on a weekly basis. And she she had to have loved movies as much as I did because she was right there with us. And we saw everything from, you know, the R-rated comedies of the <laughs> 70s and 80s, like Animal House and, and Porky's and stuff like nice. that. Wow. Um, I saw Porky's at age seven. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Why not? And so I grew up in the movie theater, and, and so I kind of worshipped Hollywood in the movies, and that was my primary form of entertainment. And then... Uh, when I was 10 years old, a little movie came out called Star Wars that changed my life. And I was fascinated with how they did it, how they made it, the blue screen and effects. And and uh, and finally, I felt like there were movies that were being made for me. Because prior to Star Wars, you know, there was Jaws, which I loved. But there was like Chinatown and Bonnie and Clyde and stuff like that. These like ultra-violent movies that weren't really geared toward kids. And, and right. So when Star Wars came out, I'm like, this movie speaks to me. Because it, it had all the action, adventure, but it wasn't graphic. It, there's right. nothing <clears throat> objectionable, uh, excuse me, uh, objectionable about it. Yeah. Uh, and you could take your 10-year-old kid to see it. Yeah, know? and it just had yeah. a different approach to sci-fi where instead of being shiny and futuristic, the vehicles were like beat up and rusty, and, and it had this real feel, this real world lived-in feel. And I had never seen anything like it, and obviously uh, the rest of the world had never seen anything like it because it became such a huge phenomenon. But to me, Star Wars, and maybe to a lesser extent Jaws, which kicked off the blockbuster era, um, that was such a great period as a, a young man growing up uh, in the Spielberg age and uh, you know having Spielberg and Lucas collaborate on, on Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that was such a great period to grow up in the movie theater yeah and, if you think what 72 to about 92 a good oh, 20 yeah. year span where you had spielberg lucas de palma coppola oh that, yeah that group of them it really was yeah. john, john waters no i'm <laughs> <laughs> joking that would have really scarred me as a six-year-old um but yeah it was such a great time period to grow up in the movie theaters and going to the mall with friends and going to movies and later on going to the midnight screenings you know when they started doing that that was kind of a cool phenomenon yeah. that came later Joe which which mall did you go to 
with your friends. Uh, well, I grew up, up in Hamtramck, uh, so we had our choice of several malls. Uh, usually it was uh, Oakland Mall. Uh, there was uh, Eastland. Uh, out, uh, there was a mall out in the Eastland yeah, yep. area there. Uh, and, uh, gosh, Dearborn, Fairlane Mall. Okay. So we, we had our choice of numerous malls, but I, I loved in the 80s that mall environment and yes. going to the movies and then hanging out and going to the food court with friends. An arcade. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, uh, Great Lakes Crossing used to have it. They used to have an arcade. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember seeing episode one over there. Yep, I, I, I did. I saw that, and I enjoy, I joined the gentleman who, I can't remember, but he had a spoiler. There's like, you know, Qui Gon dies, right? <laughs> I was like, why would you say that? Look, yeah. well, I bought the soundtrack because this is funeral. I'm like, yeah, none of us did, genius. But <laughs> that was like that scene in The Simpsons when uh, Homer and Marge come out of the theater when they were dating in the '80s and. <laughs> There's a long line to get in, and Homer goes, oh, I can't believe Darth Vader's Luke's father. And they're like, come on! <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, so, yeah, so I grew up just having a passion in movies and a fascination. And and uh, when I finally made my way out to Hollywood, to me, that was like a, a fairyland. Like, I didn't see the negativity. I didn't see the homelessness and stuff like that. I, I just thought it was like a la-la land. And... Uh, I was just fascinated with it. And so that's the Hollywood sign calls to me. It's my beacon. Um, and so I'm kind of grateful that I grew up in the Midwest and didn't have that curtain pulled. Like if you grew up in L.A., you probably saw movies being made on the streets every day. And I think so, some of that magic would be lost. But growing up in the Midwest, you know, you, you go in, it's escapism. You sit in a darkened movie theater and for two hours you're transported. And so there's this magic. That's for a movies. good point, because. Most of us see what's in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. You never really think about what's going on behind it. But if you grow up around there, yeah, casting calls, you know, wardrobe, makeup, yeah, and all the assistants, all the all the grunt work that sometimes is thankless and sometimes yeah. is very depressing. Imagine like being an extra and you see your hero and you try to talk to him and then he has you thrown off the set for yeah. making eye contact. You know, like, like I like, wouldn't want like to experience. Mike Myers that. did during uh, <laughs> the Love Guru. Did he oh, he it? did? Or, or is it during uh, Goldmember? It was one of those movies. <laughs> it, can, it can't be Love Guru. He can't afford to throw anyone off of for how crappy <laughs> yeah, that movie that was. was. That was it. No, no, him, right? look it up. Yeah. Somebody looked him in the eye, and he was That's fired. wild. Yep. Yeah, so I didn't want to have that bubble burst. Right. I, I love the fantasy of films. And uh, and so I have such a passion for films that um, when the AFI created their 100 greatest movie list, I decided I was going to create mine. I challenged you guys to create your 100 greatest yes, movie list. Yes, you did. Um, I own uh, over 650 DVDs. Uh, and that doesn't include TV shows. Those are just movies, 650 movies. As a matter of fact, I recently downloaded an app to have, help me keep track of what I have and what I still need. I have a little wish list. Oh. Um, but that's how passionate I am about movies is uh, I, I love the physical media. You know, today with streaming, you always hear, oh, well, Netflix pulled this and, and Disney pulled that. Yeah. And it's like, well, I have it on my shelf over here, so I don't really care. Um, so, yeah, uh, just movies have always been a passion of mine. I just love them. So um, what role did movies have um, in, in your life, your childhood growing up? Imagine those, Pete. Yeah, you know what? I It's similar to you. I love the idea of escapism. For me, when you, when you watch a movie, the lights go down – all eyes are on the screen. I love going. I love. Go, I'm like you. I love going to the theater. I'll always have the pandemic be damned. I'll always enjoy yeah. going to the theater. I just wish I could go more. Uh, but yeah, when the lights go down, you sit back. You're transported to a whatever world is out there. Whatever you're being invited to go on a journey with you. Big old greasy bucket of popcorn. Oh, the whole the whole Coke. nine. Okay. Coke, What's your favorite Coke movie candy? Oh, Skittles. Skittles, really? <laughs> Skittles and Reese's. They were one and one A. For it, me, it was Raisinets or Junior Mints, depending on my mood. I'm glad we have differences. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a big sweets guy, so I would usually get like I would usually just get like chick you know, like chicken tenders or you know, some you know, sort of like ah, That's fine. I I can't knock something it. Something savory. Yeah, I can't knock it. Uh, there's flavored popcorn, the there are certain chains, movie chains that allow you to put nacho flavoring, ranch flavoring, and there's some weird concoctions that come up. Yeah, I love when I they order. allow you? <laughs> Whoa, yeah. radical idea. I love when I get to the counter and I order a big bucket of popcorn and they go, do you want butter in the middle of it? And I'm like, yes, of course. Don't insult me. Put top, that butter in top, the middle. Top to bottom. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love it. If my fingers aren't shiny, 
have a problem. <laughs> That's right. Now, did you have a, a movie that just like changed your life? Yes. Like, I didn't get to do what my my, my I have an older brother. Uh, he was born in seventy two, so he got to do Star Wars and when he was at the right age. Wow. Oh yeah. You know, that per, almost like almost like you uh, that perfect age when you yeah. go in there. So that the the whole thing when the Star Destroyer first shows up overboard. Mm. And, oh my God, my. I like to, I'm, I don't want to speak for my generation, but I'm going to try to. Uh, I, you know, I'm Gen X at the tail end. My moment was Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. Oh. That was a game changer. And yeah. I went in there because I saw, you saw the trailers because back then they didn't really hype it as much with the trailers. You don't really know what's going on. I'm like, it's, when you see the, the T Rex foot stepping on the mud, I'm like, that looks like a Stan Winston kind of thing. Okay, so there's going to be some good. I, when the reaction that everybody had when they saw the, the Brontosaurus. Oh, the very first reveal. Oh, the Brachiosaurus. Yeah. Sorry, the Brachiosaurus. When everyone's that reaction, that was, I was like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. I looked at my dad. Dinosaurs are real. You lied to me. <laughs> <laughs> Think about this. I just a few years prior, around nineteen ninety ninety one, I had uh, heard about Michael Crichton's book, picked it up. I was working nights, and so I had to sit at this desk and play programs on the air. So I had a lot of time to kill. So I read Jurassic Park twice from beginning to end in the span of like a week, literally. Yep. And I just thought it was amazing. And so then when they announced that Spielberg was going to do the movie, I was excited that it was Spielberg, but I was I was uh, incredulous that they were going to be able to pull this off. I'm like, we're not there. We don't have the technology for this. And if they were to do stop motion no, animation, it would have been a disaster. Um, and then you see those first trailers and, and you see the T-Rex and it's like, Oh my God! I I recently saw some of the tests of the uh, the raptors in the kitchen scene. Yeah, side by side, you know what they stop ended motion. up doing, and then the stop motion. It's like, yeah, that was a big leap forward at that time. It, it was. really was that, and uh, what they did with uh, Terminator Two. Yes, um, and the T two thousand T one thousand with the metal. It was just metal. like. Pew. Yeah, that that was uh, again a great time to be a movie buff. We witnessed these l- right. great leaps forward that still hold up to this day, yeah. and you wonder why CGI in in most cases isn't as good as it was thirty years ago. And that's the thing I think because it got mass produced and people just oh just CGI and there's no care in it. They were very they took they st- stressed over that yeah. to get that absolutely right. The sunlight had to hit it. Everything had to look great. And I think it's also perfect timing. Spielberg's one of those greats. The music, the John, because it's oh yeah, oh there it is. The, yeah. There's the island, and so you get the build up, the build up, the build up, and then they yeah. give you that little. They're not impressed. They're not convinced. I'm not convinced. I'm going to shut you down, down, John. I'm like okay, yeah. so then they hit you with the, and then hit, the music hits you again, and. We could do an entire podcast on John Williams, yeah. and and we probably will do that because you know when you hear stories about Star Wars, when people saw. You know, early cuts of Star Wars are like, this is a disaster. And then when they had the big premiere and the music came in, a lot of the model makers and behind the scenes guys were like, who did this? Is this the one we worked on? It wow. was like, it was a different movie when the James Earl Jones' voice you know, comes in instead of exactly. David Prowse's voice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which they do in Spaceballs with Rick Moranis. That's and- right. That's what he sounded like, Dark Helmet in yeah. that movie. <laughs> Andrew, what what was a game changer for you? Like, what is? Give me an early memory where you sat transfixed in a darkened movie theater. Okay, so in terms of theater, same story. It was Jurassic Park. Mm. Yeah, um, I saw it. There used to be a movie, a fifty cent movie theater, like we were talking about, at Rochester and Hamlin, I believe it was AMC Hampton. It was at Hampton. The, 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 it, it was it used to be a dollar movie, but I think it was. Fifty cents. Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. So I was nine. So mm-hmm. that came out in summer '93, right? Yeah. So I, w- I would have been nine, and I had been begging my my mom all summer to take me. And so <laughs> it was later in the summer because it was at the you know the the cheap theater. And she's like, "Okay, fine. I think it might have been my birthday in July. We'll take you. Fine, we'll go." So we made this big, huge event out of it. Like my grandma went, my best friend, like neighbor, and his mom went. My sis, my sister, who was only six at the time, went. So I'm like, oh, maybe. And it, <laughs> it was kind of, kind of young for. Had nobody seen it in your family that nobody had seen it. That's see, wow. that's good. That's a collective. I'm thing pretty on. sure. I know. I, I I know neither of my parents had seen it, but that was that was a, one of my earliest like like big theater moments. Mm. You, you guys are gonna love this. Just recently. I, you know, I save a lot of ticket stubs, concerts, movies, yep. sporting you events, too. 
and I dumped out a bunch of tickets uh, fairly recently. And as I sorted through them, I found my Jurassic Park tickets. And uh, what's interesting is the date on the ticket is the day before the official release. So I must have went to like the the late, the night, the night prior, yeah. the late show Ooh, the nice. night before. So I I was there opening night. So very and, cool. And I, I yeah. tell a lot of kids and younger people. I, I say saying that now, <laughs> feel old, but. I tell them that's that's an experience. I hope and I hope they get to see it. Some of them will say, I think for the younger generation, they say, "Oh, the first time I saw a- Avatar in 3D, yeah. the first one." They're like, "That was my moment." Like, okay, two. I I hope generations yeah. get to have that. Yeah, feeling because I feel like Star Wars, Jurassic Park, for me, to some extent, because I'm a big fan of the genre, Fellowship of the Ring. When I finally yeah, saw Lord of the Lord Rings, Rings come out, and, and for a more recent generation, Harry Potter movies, yep. and then the Marvel movies. I mean, think oh. of the young people who grew up during that ten year period of the Marvel movies. They're gonna when they're thirty, forty, fifty years old, they're gonna be like, remember when uh, when uh, Captain America picked up you know the hammer or whatever? It's, those I, are gonna be the moments they're talking. about. I mean, about. if they're ten year olds who saw the Iron Man in two thousand eight, they're twenty five now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, like, I, 15 years from now, I don't want to be talking to somebody who's, like, at that, t- at, at that time I'm talking to them, like, 30 or 35, and I ask them, you know, what was a great defining movie experience for you? Uh, I don't know. I was just on my phone all the time. I, yeah, right. I was just on TikTok all the time. I was playing video games. I'm like, yeah. Uh, that, that those are your memories. Or they'll of that say, time? The, "Oh, there's something like the Irishman on Netflix." I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I watched yeah. that over the course of three days. Yeah. No, no, and that you know that's a good segue here because that's one thing I wanted to talk about on our inaugural episode. Uh, I hate to say this, but I feel like we're living in the dark times when it comes to the movies. You mentioned COVID earlier. COVID had a significant impact on the moviegoers that we i don't think have fully recovered from yet no um it gave rise to streaming and more people seem to be comfortable watching these movies at home yet uh, or watching it at home and you know prior to covid i would be in the movie theater 20 to 25 times a year yeah like every other weekend i was in the theater watching a movie and i it was i love that in theater experience with a, a bunch of live people cheering and laughing and clapping at the same time, COVID rolls around and I, I, I want to, I can't remember which, what was the first movie I saw in the theater after COVID. I want to say it might've been James Bond or something. Um, and there were only like a handful of people in the theater. And now I'm down to, maybe five to 10 movies a year. You can if count that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the worst part about it, when I say that we're living in the dark times, it's not necessarily the movie going experience, but also the caliber and quality of movies I yes. think have really dropped. Like what was the last epic movie you saw where, you know, you stood and cheered together with strangers. You have to, Kind of go back to those Marvel movies in the pre-COVID days, but Oppenheimer for me. Okay, well, we're going to the, talk about Oppenheimer. <laughs> in a the la- last one was they were standing and cheering kind of thing. That would be Avengers: Infinity War the, before Endgame. Oh, that well, was the last one. there was that moment in Endgame though, where the hammer scene that I talked yeah. about earlier. I that was one of my top ten favorite in theater experiences I've ever had. The, the crowd lost their mind. Oh, well, yep, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that one. The for, for me, the bookend part, the last movie I saw before COVID hit was Star Wars Episode Nine, and that was not a good way to go out. No. <laughs> and then my first movie that brought me back, as I said, you know, I'm going to bite the bullet. I, I got the vaccine. I'm going to go. I got the shots. Try to sit, you know, with spacing. The Batman. Oh. With Robert yeah. Pattinson. That that brought me back. I was like, I'm going to, this is, this will be the one I'm going to, you know, I'll tell you when they had the Batman been released a few months earlier, I might have had to wait. Yeah. I wasn't comfortable enough going back to the theater. Well, the Batman is one of the few movies that come to mind that I would rather see on the big screen than on the small screen. It was yeah. so epic. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad I saw that in a theater on yeah. the big screen. Me too. 
Um, but there aren't a lot of movies right now that people say, oh, you need to see it on the big screen. There's still a few, like Oppenheimer. Um, uh, and I, I regret to say, and we're going to get into this in a little bit, but I regret to say that I hadn't seen the new Godzilla movie yet that people are raving about. And I don't know if that's something you have to see on the big screen. I don't know. If you um, get a chance, I would. Just uh, with the sound, because I happen, I got a chance to do it. So oh, good. That's yeah. one, if you get an opportunity, you can. I think if you watch it at home, yeah. and you have a good setup with surround sound you'll still have a great time yeah but if you get it if you have a chance to do it you should i hope i get a chance to see it so since we're talking about the dark times let's recap 2023 oh boy. um which i feel personally is one of the weakest years in movies ever i second that. um and that's saying something because i'm factoring in 2020 <laughs> um it was rough uh the movies that I, that did bring me into the theater uh, I was indifferent about, I, I, most of them, I just shrugged, uh, at least one of them I walked out of, uh, we're going to talk about some of those. Imagine that. Imagine in a post COVID era, I made an effort to go to the theater to see a movie that I got up and walked out of. That's From really one of your favorite something. directors. Every one of my favorite directors. See, that was <laughs> a shocking part. When you told me the movie yeah. that I, I've only walked out of one movie in my life and that was a Bill Murray movie it was the comedy where he played a spy. I even forgot the name of it. <laughs> it came out like late nineties, probably early two thousands, like two thousand one, two thousand two. It was so awful. I was like, you know what? I'm out. I wish I had this sound drop. I may have to add this sound drop, but on, uh, there's one of my favorite lines on Gilligan's Island is when they made a movie and Mr. Howell says, I'd walk out of that movie on an airplane. And I <laughs> love that line. Uh, and there's a few that I've seen that I would consider that. So let's talk about 2023. Now, you know, I, I used to do a podcast called Movies for Dumb Guys. And, and the, the, point of that podcast is that most of my favorite movies aren't necessarily Academy Award winners. They're just crowd pleasers. They're entertaining. I just want a movie to entertain me. And so when I, when I tell people my favorite movie of 2023, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but then there's a little bit of pride in it. But the movie that I found most entertaining in 2023 was John Wick chapter four. Now, I went in sort of begrudgingly because I thought that it didn't need to go beyond the trilogy. I thought it was a great trilogy and it yeah. didn't necessarily need a chapter four. Um, but I did go in to see chapter four and I was blown away, not by the story, not by the acting, but by the, the visuals and the cinematography and how beautifully it was shot and lit. And it was, it was a work of art. I thought it was just stunning. And yeah, people complain that the John Wick movies are ultra violent and, and yeah, I, I get it, but it's a cartoon violence. It's not, it's not like people being awful to each other like they are in the real world. It's just sort of a silly violence ballet that you don't really, uh, kind of you, know, top you don't mourn a death of, you know, a, a a goon that's coming at John Wick. You're like, oh, you got what you a deserve. A violence ballet. I like it the way is. you put that. Yeah. <laughs> and so of all the movies that I saw in 2023, John Wick Chapter 4 was my favorite. And it's the only movie that I've bought over the past year on DVD or Blu-ray. Um, I own all the John Wick movies. I think they're a lot of fun. And I've gotten to the point now where a movie has to be very, very special for me to add it to my media yeah. library. And John Wick is the only movie I've bought in a recent movie that I've added to my collection. Uh, have you had a chance to see John Wick? Yeah, I overall, I enjoy the John Wick movies. John Wick for me is like when you're on your third bowl of Fruity Pebbles and the milk is pink. Like your body <laughs> knows you've overdone it. And that's why I felt like at some point, like when you're seven to eight actual screen minutes into a gunfight, like, okay, guys, we need a break. Like, <laughs> do something else, and then give me 10 minutes, and let's come back to the shooting. Because yeah. the, the action sequences got progressively longer in each movie. They were like, can we outdo ourselves? So by John Wick yeah. Ford, there was one sequence, the stair sequence. Oh, yeah, it went on. Uh, that was a 12-and-a-half-minute <laughs> gunfight. Yeah. I'm like, wow, what is going on, John? Like, you have ridiculous stamina. And, like, where are all the bad guys? You know, it's funny you say that because those sequences, those those fight sequences – were broken into chunks, and each one had its own identity and style, you know, like the stair sequence or the one where the camera's shooting straight down like an arcade game, you know. And, and it's funny how the movie's broken into these beats where you, you see, like, this amazing uh, fight scene, shoot-up scene, 
And then there's a bit of a break. Then there's another amazingly orchestrated piece. And then there's a bit of a break. And there, so it's broken into these beats, and each one has its own style and feel. Like in the John Wick universe, the top fight to me between all four movies is John Wick 3 when they go to Casablanca and uh, we have Halle Berry and John Wick fighting their way out of the. Yeah. With, with her two dogs. That was pretty because oh, that yeah, yeah. That was fun for me because it gave, it wasn't all John doing all the work. Mm-hmm. I got to see a little bit of flavor because usually it's John versus Common. <laughs> you know, in, yeah. in John Wick 2, which was, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> but otherwise, it, you get that battle fatigue sometimes. And that was the only one. For me, the movie that brought me back was A Haunting in Venice because I fell in love with that trilogy mm. with Kenneth Branagh playing Hercule Poirot. When I saw Haunting Events, I wasn't even expecting it because I'd been such a in, in a hermit hole. Mm-hmm. And when it came out, I was like, "Oh, okay, there you go, Haunting Venice." That that stood out to me. Is that your number one movie of the year? Which it shouldn't be, yeah. but in in a 2023 year, that'll be for me. I'm I'm going to put that up there. Not I I if he had if I had my Mount Rushmore, I'd put John Wick four up in there. But it's mm-hmm. movies that I it was enjoyed. Come on, see, but Haunting Venice stood out for me. All right, I haven't seen it, so I'm going to add it to my watch list yeah i haven't seen it either andrew i think i know the answer to this question but what is your number one movie of 20 number one was directed by mr christopher nolan one of my all-time favorite directors yeah oppenheimer so i i didn't get around to seeing it in theaters but knowing that we were going to be doing this podcast i'm like i it's, i know it's going to come up so i need to watch it yeah um, joe you send us homework uh, I had to do, <laughs> and i had to cram i did barbie and oppenheimer much uh, <laughs> much like the host of the golden globes who apparently watched oppenheimer days before his golden globes hosting gig um i i sat down and watched it now you had mentioned prior to the podcast that sometimes when, when you see a movie after all the hype, it doesn't live up to it. So I had that going against it, that it was so hyped when I finally got around to seeing it. Uh, and after seeing it at home on my couch, uh, I got to say I liked it, but I didn't love it. Tell me tell me why you loved Oppenheimer. I saw it opening night in a almost completely sold out theater at uh, AMC Great Lakes Crossing and their big semi IMAX theater right, right. with two buddies. Um, it had everybody in it that you could possibly imagine that Amazing ensemble cast. was great. Robert Downey Jr. for best supporting actor, hands down. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Great. He won the golden globe, right? Yeah. 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 It was an incredible cast. And I, I do admit that the acting performances, they're, they're probably going to sweep a lot of Oscar categories. Cinematography. Um, yeah. The soundtrack, mm-hmm. yeah, um, the score, yeah, yeah, the score. Um, What's interesting? My my only thing is, uh, what? Yes, yes. Of, <laughs> I hate saying this, but I have had to say it lately for for good movies that there, it could have shaved off like a half hour. Yes, yeah. it was a full three hours. It was. And here's, so, uh, so that's my that's, that's my only thing about against the movie. Usually, when I when I watch a movie, sometimes I'll pop out my phone and I'll go to IMDb and I like reading little trivia and stuff about a film. And this kind of ticked me off. And I don't know if this is true or not. I just read it on IMDb. But one of the little trivia notes said that Christopher Nolan had said to his people that he collaborates with, he goes, "I want Oppenheimer to be longer than my longest movie." And I'm like, "What kind of goal is that?" Who says I want this movie to be long? Why, Chris? <laughs> that's, no. that's, that's, that's my first question. Why? Well, yeah, and I don't get that. The focus on length. And here's the weird thing, and maybe this is just me, but as I was watching, you know, the first half hour, 45 minutes of it, the pacing seemed sort of odd to me, and it felt almost as if the first cut of the movie was four hours long. And to get it down to three hours long, he cut out any pauses because the dialogue yeah, yeah. is almost like an old Cary Grant movie where the lines are just right on top of each other. Someone says a line, someone else says a line, and it, and the pacing seemed awkward. Like they're like, if we cut out a pause here and a um here and a pause here, we we could whittle off thirty seconds. And it's like it seemed odd that it they whittled it down to three hours, like a like yeah. a like an Aaron Sorkin. TV series, yeah, show where yeah. everyone's in the blah 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 blah. Yeah, and but. there's a time and place for Aaron Sorkin type <laughs> piece and dialogue. And yeah, Oppenheimer just didn't feel like there'd be a lot. Look, I guess if you have a bunch of nerds, you know, go, going back and forth at each other, that'd be one thing. But I, I think the idea behind 
it was probably Christopher Nolan wanted to put as many words into the movie because the movie right. is so wordy. There's so it much is. information you have to keep up on. Oh, okay, this was this real person during uh, World War II. This was this. And you're constantly being bombarded by tons of information. Right. Um. So, yeah, I've only seen the movie once, and I'm sure I'll pick up something something new. Oppenheimer um, to me is like Shindler, next time I Shindler's see List. I'm probably going to watch that once every four or five years. Huh. Just I don't to, have any desire to see it again. But yeah. let me say this, and I know this sounds really arrogant of me, but this is what movie people do. Had I done Oppenheimer, if I took the book that it was based on and wanted to to turn it into a movie, I don't think I would have focused on the courtroom drama aspect as much as Nolan did. And I'm, I'm sure that was a big part of the book. What I needed, what I wanted to see and was completely glossed over in this movie was, okay, here you have all these eggheads, you know, getting together, trying to outdo each other. How can we do this bomb? How can we do this bomb? How do we beat Germany? How do we beat the, the, the Soviets? And I enjoyed that aspect of the movie and they almost turned it into a competition, almost like a game. Like, what if we do hydrogen? What if we do this? Blah, 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 blah. And what the movie glossed over is once they they built the bombs and they were carted off the Los Alamos or wherever that was, um, they glossed over the global impact that those bombs had on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the people that lived there and the kids and the families. I mean, the majority of those killed in the initial blast were families and kids yeah, and yeah. civilians. Yeah. I, I had read a fact that I think for Nagasaki, I think there was only like maybe 100 or 200 soldiers that were killed. The rest were civilians. Yeah. And the movie sort of glossed over that. It, it was a tragedy. It was a horror. It might have been a war crime. And the movie it sort of was. Was jumped right past crime. that. <laughs> and then they got into this drama about whether Oppenheimer can be trusted. And I was like, huh, that's a direction I don't think I would have gone. It's, right. Yeah, it, it's definitely two movies it could have been split into two two yeah. separate movies. almost like two chapters yeah depending on what you want to focus on and for me i you know it's inspired by true events so at that point i knew that there were going to be a lot of liberties taken i mean one of the biggest things that they they always say is that they were trying to beat the germans from getting the bomb whereas all the the oss and all the major intel but especially with the british and said the germany gave up on the, on the bomb in 1942 and focused on rockets to mm -hmm. attack the united states and to attack great britain yeah People yeah V1, V2 rockets. That's where they were putting all their energy into. They had abandoned nuclear bomb, the nuclear bomb. So yeah. that was 1942, which is about the time they were greenlighting the Manhattan Project to go full stream. So they knew it behind the scenes. Yeah. This is about focusing on what comes next. Yeah. Which was the, the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yep. Right, right. And the Cold War and yeah. all that stuff. I, I've heard so. a lot of historians say that the bombing. The bombing of those two cities was also... It was a message. It was a message to the Soviet Union. Like, okay... To be ready for Potsdam. Yeah. Truman right. wanted it ready by we, Potsdam. We defeated Hitler, uh, but yeah. we're the big boys now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, so that that was interesting. And the other... The, the, the most riveting aspect of the movie that I personally found was the s small percentage that they were going to destroy the world that they weren't yeah, yeah. 100% <laughs> yeah. certain that they weren't going to turn Earth into a flaming ball of fire. And just ignite it like the sun. And I said, <laughs> uh, the chances are minuscule. But you're saying, you know, I think, uh, uh, the, what's his name, the actor, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Damon. Damon, yeah, he, he, he goes, I would prefer if it was zero chance. And they're like, oh, it's close to zero. And I'm like, these arrogant assholes <laughs> were willing to risk the entire planet to get an edge up over Germany and the Soviet Union. I'm like, to me, that was the most shocking part yeah, of the film. I think that's also kind of what the Germans were thinking along those lines. They said, it's not, it's not worth it. There's no, <laughs> there's no Reich yeah. <laughs> if there's no air. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pure, so, let's... so that was shocking to me. But let's, let's talk about something else in the film. And I've seen other people talk about this. Now, keep in mind, I grew up in the 80s. Like I said, I saw Porky's Animal House, Ridgemont High, I, I was a sucker for gratuitous nudity. I had no problem with it growing up in the 80s. Let's talk about the gratuitous nudity in Oppenheimer. Um, at first, it didn't really bother me too much until they got to that kind of fantasy sequence in the in the boardroom there where yeah. Oppenheimer's having sex in front of all these people or whatever. And I'm like, 
what was the point of that? Yeah. Why was that necessary? That that seemed. I mean, I know it was through the eyes of the wife who yeah. was just now finding out that Oppenheimer was unfaithful to her. Right. But she I, felt betrayed and yeah. uh, disassociated. But that, so. if I was sitting in the theater, I would be like looking at the people next to me, like, oh no, like that felt very out of place and awkward. How did you guys feel about that? I I felt it was it was not. It was not Nolan like. Like he's never done yeah. like a scene like that before. So I, and I think everyone around me was like kind of like shocked. Like oh, the, you know, we weren't expecting this. Yeah, where did yeah. that come from and why? But, where um, did it come from and why? Yeah, I think I, I but I, in other aspects of the film, um, with there's more swearing in the movie. He wanted to make like a true like R rated film. Yeah, and so I think this is because he. Be, I think all of his movies before, except for maybe Insomnia. Or Memento, or all PG thirteen. So I think right. he wanted to push the envelope a little bit to see what he, yeah, because he's never done any nudity. I don't think. Yeah, I, so. I, I had I had friends in the Hindu community that were a little bit <laughs> up in arms. <laughs> oh, and, oh, they didn't like when when he was uh, reciting. Uh, I think it was the it was the nature <laughs> of that scene. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think I think we all know for spoilers uh, during a uh, copulation scene. I guess is is the best way to put mm-hmm. it, and it's like. That that didn't happen, right? Like why? I he was a fan. Like he he was a well-read man. He he was very deeply philosophical, and he looked into things. But why would you introduce it like that at that yeah. point? Like that seemed again that seemed very unnolan like in any yeah. of his movies. Like right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And I, I'm not even a big ultra you know ultra Hindu national all that kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, I was like, why? Why, Chris? Why? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's how I felt. So, is it in my top ten? Yes. Mostly because, like I said, I think it was a weak year of movies. Were the acting performances astounding? Yes. the act. I mean, I was mesmerized by Killian Murphy. I just thought yep. he was just riveting and just incredible. And he's easily the front runner for the Oscar, uh, Best As- mm-hmm. Actor Oscar. Um, but I, I do have some problems with the, the movie, and um, so... I'm glad we had a chance. Twenty twenty three is just a, it was a down year. I, I maybe you know people yeah. with the writer strike and the actor strike. People don't know which ones you know the way they get to hype them enough. What movies were supposed to come out? I got pushed to twenty twenty four. So mm. is twenty twenty four going to be overloaded with good stuff? Can, me? can I just yeah. a- ask you guys one last thing about Oppenheimer that yeah. we can move on? Do you, me- do you remember the scene where um, I forgot the character's name, but F- Florence Pugh, like yeah. you know the the chick he cheats on? Yeah or cheats with um when she drowns that scene did you notice a hand with a a glove and a a brief scene like behind her head holding her down underwater no yeah it was insinuating that it was very brief and and then i'm like wow did i see that and then i looked it up online and they said that suicide right well there's no evidence that anyone killed her but yeah they're thinking that that might have been just through the point of view of Oppenheimer. Like maybe he got paranoid and thought, yeah, they had her killed. Huh. Anyway, that was one very artistic thing. But I'm like, wow, that was yeah, yeah. that was awesome. You huh. know, that goes back to the whole um, uh, Marilyn Monroe movie with Anna de Armas. Yeah, ex- excellent performance, but the movie was a yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now let's uh, let's move on to the pink elephant in the room. Yeah. Uh, the the. Biggest movie of the year, box office wise, uh, that generated the most uh, chatter, is the Barbie movie. And initially, I, I didn't have much interest in seeing it. Uh, you know, I, I thought the movie was geared toward the, the generation that grew up with Barbies, and it was going to be kind of focused for them or whatever. And I'm like, you girls go have your fun or whatever. Uh, but then when I saw that it was just such a, this huge blockbuster, and, and when my sisters went to go see it, they're like, we we wept, we cried. And I'm like, okay, now I'm intrigued. So after it had been uh, out in theaters for a week or two, I said, all right, I got a friend and we went to go uh, see Barbie. And again, like Oppenheimer, I liked it. I didn't love it. I do get why women love it. Um, it, it was, you know, I, I don't like to use the word woke and I know people criticize it for being woke. It did have an agenda. It, it was trying to make a statement and make a point, which I totally get. Um, personally, I feel that, uh, Ryan Gosling stole the movie. I thought he was absolutely hysterical in that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I liked the color palette. I liked, 
Um, the look of the film, uh, it was interesting, you know, going between the world of Barbie to the real world and back again. Uh, and not a lot of it made a whole lot of sense, but um, <laughs> so I place it number two on my list only because it was such a huge phenomenon. Um, and but I didn't love it. I don't plan on buying it. I don't plan on rewatching it. But I I get why it's the phenomenon that it is. Um, one refreshing thing about it, even though it's based on a, a you know Mattel intellectual property, it wasn't necessarily a sequel or a prequel or a reboot. It was something new for uh, a current generation of moviegoers. But um, uh, so I liked it. I, I didn't love it, but it's number two on my list. What What are your thoughts on the Barbie movie? For me, I was I was irritated, not because the movie was bad. I it was enjoyable. The thing was. The very people that went and fluffed this thing up and gave all the hype and <laughs> showered it with praise are the same people that will say, "Oh, I don't understand this fantasy concept. I don't. I can't understand this absurdist comedy or this suspension of disbelief." It's like like in Groundhog Day. They don't get how why is the day keep repeating? It just does. <laughs> so you you shit on Groundhog Day, but you have no problem with all of a sudden Barbie leaving Barbie Land and people can just go back and forth and somehow a girl plays with this doll and it affects this particular Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> like, no one asked the questions like, why, okay, why, so when that Barbie got doll got made, is that when Margot Robbie popped? So you don't want us to think, you just want us to accept it. Okay, yeah. so if I have to accept that stuff, you can't accept it on any other comedies or obscenerous comedies. They always give these, you know, and it's the same Hollywood execs and suits that'll say the same thing. The gatekeepers, I'll say, oh, this doesn't make sense. Pick a lane. Are you like drama or comedy or is it service? I'm like, okay, but apparently if you have an agenda, everything's fine. <laughs> and so, no, it, I most of the points I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Ken did steal the movie. Ken reminded me of Robert Downey Jr. and Jack Black in Tropic Thunder. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the side character stole that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Tom Cruise yeah. stole that movie. From you know, no, no. If Ben Stiller wasn't in the movie, I wouldn't have cared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, one one thing uh, that kind of cracked me up when I finally did see Barbie is there was a lot of criticism that I had read going into it, saying uh, it's overly feminist, blah 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 blah. And I'm like, it's a movie about Barbie, yeah, about a doll that is the president of the United States, is an astronaut. The Barbie's message to young girls is you can be whatever you want to be, whatever you dream of. That is Barbie. So to criticize the movie for being feminist, you clearly missed the point. That's what Barbie is all about, is feminism. So you you can't cite that as a, as a demerit against the movie when it's staying true to Barbie. Exactly. And see, Andrew, I want to get your thoughts, because that's that's one of the things where, the, you know, in the world they talk about the, the patriarchal society, where it's a, Barbie created unrealistic beauty standards. Barbie, you know, did all these things about how girls would identify and uh, am I pretty, am I not pretty, what I can and cannot be. So you can be president, except in the real world, as our real life politics have shown. You can be <laughs> any of these other things. You could be a doctor, but not paid as much as a real doctor. Mm -hmm. You could act in the same movie. Margot Robbie probably got paid less than, <laughs> it, if it came out to me that Ryan Gosling got paid more than Margot Robbie, would not shock me. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's not true, and but it would shock me. that's the point the movie was trying to make, yeah. is that the, outside of that world of Barbie, where Barbie rules, in the real world, it's not necessarily the case. And, you know, you mentioned uh, the unrealistic beauty standards. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Mattel allowed the movie to address that because, you know, that's one of the flaws of Barbie is even though she was president and astronaut, she always had a tiny little waist and had these crazy real world yeah. proportions. Um, and it did create these unrealistic beauty standards. And, and Mattel was like, okay, we'll, we'll concede. We'll allow that. And that kind of, I applaud them for that, I, for letting him criticize Barbie as well as... Uh, I, I think they, they played that off well with uh, Will Ferrell's character as the, yeah. the CEO or whatever. Yeah. And, and that aspect of it, they were kind of like, you know, self-effacing. Not self-effacing, but, well, you know, they're yeah, yeah. holding a mirror up like, okay, all right. We get a bunch it, guys. of guys in a boardroom yeah. were dictating Barbie. This is the yeah. jaded ass in me. They, this reminds me of like a pharmaceutical company that's used up a drug and now allows the patent to expire because they've made their money and established their market share where they can afford to take. You want to take a couple of shots at the big dog? Yeah. Go ahead, take. We we accept it. Yeah, but we'll we're wipe not our going tears anywhere. with our money. Yeah, but we're not going anywhere. Mattel's <laughs> not going anywhere. Barbie's not going anywhere. Thank you for making it a big success. It yeah. makes us money. 
Yeah, and follow in the wake of the movie, the Barbie was hot for Christmas, huge for Christmas. Everyone wanted the Barbie, Mattel people so. say the Margot Robbie Bobby <laughs> or Barbie. Barbie yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like they'll 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 market the toys I exactly. Mean, like so, yeah. Uh, for people that criticized it for saying, "Oh, it had an agenda," yes, yeah, some filmmakers like Greta had an agenda. She had yeah. a thing that she pointed which gets, gets across. Welcome to Hollywood. Yeah, every filmmaker has something they want to say with their story. So she yeah. said it. I mean, th- those those are weird criticisms. My thing was, you know, plot and story wasn't like be consistent. You know, th- yeah, th- that's what something like. Look, if you want me to suspend suspend disbelief, I will. I love sci fi fantasy. I'll do it. Yeah, but then don't give me shit. Yeah, <laughs> for my movies and say like, oh, you don't get the deep meaning. Like, no, go go eat eat a bag of some things. Yeah. Now you were talking about the you know feminist agenda or whatever. I I I'm, you got me thinking about the Wonder Woman movie, the first one, and I loved a little moment in Wonder Woman when uh, they're they're in the trenches, uh, artillery's flying, uh, the the soldiers just can't gain any ground, and uh, they're like, no man can uh, can gain any ground and she's like i'm no man and as she climbs out of that trench you see a sign that says no man's land and i'm like that is so deliberate Mm -hmm. but it's so awesome and of course she goes in there and kicks butt and so it's kind of done in the same vein as barbie where in the movies you can empower women to to do that and hopefully it inspires little girls in return of the king no man can kill me i am no man i'm like yep you didn't word that carefully buddy yeah now you're gonna eat it Andrew, any final thoughts on Barbie? Uh, I pretty much uh, agree with you guys on 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 the analysis. I wasn't going to pay money to see it in the theater. Yeah, I was. I spent that sixteen dollars on Oppenheimer <laughs> at, that, at that time. But as soon as it came out on Max a couple weeks ago, I saw it, and it was pretty much what I expected. Yeah. Um, I give it an eight. I guess an eight out of ten. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Now, I mentioned Barbie's color palette, how pleasing to the eye it was. Uh, the next movie on my list has a similar vibrant color palette that I enjoyed probably more than the actual movie itself, uh, Asteroid City. I knew uh, you were going to say that. Wes Anderson. Yep. Now, here's the funny thing about it. I, I talk about how much I, I relish the theater-going experience. I saw Asteroid City on the plane, and uh, wow. as I was flying home from Dallas, I'm like, okay, as we're getting ready to taxi out of the Dallas airport. I'm like, what do we got here? You know, Delta, you got the little monitors in the back of the seat. And I'm like, oh, I haven't seen Asteroid City. So I started Asteroid City, and as the credits were rolling, we touched down in Detroit. It was the exact length of the flight from Dallas to Detroit. Wow. And it was a great way to spend that trip. I, I really enjoyed the film. There's a lot of, there's a lot of blue. Yeah, movie. yeah, it is. And you, you, oranges, you've seen it, right? Blues I've seen Asteroid oranges. City, and okay. that's another movie where everyone and their mother was in that movie. Yeah, I've, amazing cast. <laughs> like people kept popping up. I'm like, oh, he's in that. She's in that. Jeff Goldblum as an alien. <laughs> yeah, somebody. <laughs> Why not? It just comes across their table like, oh, you know, Wes wants you in, uh, for a role. I'm in. Yes. Yeah. Stamp it. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what uh, Florence is. It Florence Pugh, the yeah. actress. Yeah. That's what she said when uh, she was invited to be in a, a Nolan movie. She's like, I would be an extra in a Nolan movie. Yeah, because um, I remember he told yeah. her. I said, he, he said, I'm sorry, I this part isn't as big as yeah. a couple of your recent parts. But and she was like, I, I, <laughs> yeah. why are you apologizing? To me? <laughs> but Wes is also one of those directors where sometimes uh, his sometimes some of his movies. I'm like, Wes, are you just being like this for the sake of? Some movies are awesome. Grand Budapest Hotel. I oh, loved that, it. Yeah, I, yeah. That's that. Ah, didn't I forgot to put that on my list? I would. That's the one I would, I would drop on here. In fact, hang on. You guys, <laughs> talk, you guys talk. I got. I got to drop some on my have, list. Do you have any other uh, Wes Anderson movies on here? No, the no? Grand Budapest would be no. my one that's gonna uh, get on here. So I, I, I'm, I gotta. I, mine I might kick someone off. Might be Darjeeling Limited. I love Darjeeling yeah, Limited, oh, yeah. but if I was to have, I, I don't know if I, I don't think I have any Wes Anderson movies on my hundred greatest movie list. But if I were to add one, and you guys got me thinking about it again now, um, I, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. It's the Bill Murray Royal uh, Tenenbaums. Uh, no, 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 no. Before that, L- with, Life Aquatic. Before that, the one where he's a romantic. Bill Murray's in a romantic rivalry with the student. Oh, um, R- R- Rushmore. Rush- Rushmore. Yes, Rushmore. Yes. with Jason Schwartzman. A masterpiece. Yeah. Uh. That and would be so funny. That seemed like more of a traditional movie compared to Asteroid City, where yes. Asteroid City is almost like somebody parroting Wes Anderson. Like, it, it's very Wes Anderson. Yeah. Um, but I love the characters. I love the palette. I love the silly storyline about... It was interesting how, like, s- some of the scenes that were in black and white 
were like real life, I guess. But then the the play within the movie was being acted out in the color scenes, and it was v- very odd and yeah. not for everybody. No, no. Um, but I just enjoyed the experience. I might yeah. not have known exactly what was going on all the time, but I just enjoyed the performances. I enjoyed the experience. Like I said, the color palette, uh, just the, the pleasant surprise of seeing actors pop up in various roles. And after it was all over and I touched down in Detroit and the credits were rolling, I, I just felt happy. Like, that was just a pleasant, fun movie. No negativity, nothing dark. And I think the world needs more of that. So yep. that's number three on my list, uh, Asteroid City. I, I kicked off uh, The Great Escape and added Grand Budapest Hotel. There Not because I, <laughs> Grand, The Great Escape is a great movie. It I is. love it. But I had Von Ryan's Express on here, so I could you know, <laughs> have two escape movies. So Grand Budapest gets on there. So Asteroid City is number three on yep. my list. Now, here's one that's sort of out of left field. Like, anyone who knows me would be like, really? Because I'm, if you were to ask me what types of movies are on my 100 greatest movie list, a big majority of it is comedy, but I also love those, you know, epic sci-fi action flicks like sure. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park, you know, that sort of stuff. So this next movie is not that. And it is, it is unlike most of my favorite movies but for some reason i found myself really really enjoying this movie and again maybe it had a lot to do with the fact that there were no superheroes in it there were no parallel universes or multiverses um it's called are you there god it's me margaret and it's set in the 70s i think maybe late 60s early 70s period where i was a kid And I grew up with two sisters, and I experienced a lot in real life of what they depicted in the film. And it was, again, just a very pleasant coming-of-age film um, that was just a really enjoyable experience. I just, again, at the end of the movie, credits are rolling, I just felt good having seen it. And I I, I love this phrase. I think uh, Jack Nicholson said this in... uh, uh, the one movie with uh, uh, Helen Hunt where he says, you uh, you make me want to be a better man or whatever. There are movies that change me, that make me feel like a better person for having seen it. And Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret is one of those movies that had that impact on me. Um, I heard, okay. I heard it was good. Yeah. It didn't crack my 100 greatest movie list, and, and I don't know if I'll buy it on DVD or whatever, but uh, it's, if we're talking about movies from 2023, if, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's just a, a light movie that we just don't seem to have enough of over okay. the last few years so so neither one of you have seen that one. no no uh, i mean look it's 2023 there's if it weren't for the homework that you assigned i would have been missing <laughs> some of the big ones too so all right now we're gonna get into the crap that i normally see um <laughs> and uh, the oh, only reason these... I like the way you put it. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason, again, these movies are on this list is because it was a weak, weak year for movies. Now, let's talk about the Fast and Furious franchise. I've been there since day one. Uh, 2001, I believe, is when the very first Fast yes. and Furious movie came out. And I've seen every single one of them in theaters. I've enjoyed all of them. And, Including um, Tokyo Drift? Uh, well, here's what's interesting. Tokyo Drift was at the bottom of my list for a long time because it didn't have any of the main actors or characters in it until, spoiler alert, little post credit scene. Um, and so I kind of dismissed Tokyo Drift for a long time. But I noticed online a lot of people cited it as one of their favorites. I was like, really? So I went back and rewatched it about a year or so ago. And I'm like, you know what? It's not that bad. The lead actor, the lead performer, stinks. He was terrible in it. Um, but the, the movie was pretty entertaining. So it, it kind of climbed up my list a little bit. So knowing that, I was, um, I'm there for Fast X. I was excited to see it. Uh, I know that these movies have gotten progressively sillier over time. Yes. Where they went from street racers to basically Mission Impossible, yes. uh, you know, cyber. I thought guys. they were doing heists at least. They were going to rob yeah. stuff. Now it's saving the world. I'm like, yeah. What? And and they're they're it's kind of all done tongue in cheek, you know. Like you'll hear people say, "Oh, what's next, space?" And Vin Diesel's like, "Hold my beer, we're going to yeah. space," you know. And so I sat down. And I watched Fast X. I enjoyed it. It was silly, stupid, mindless fun. But 
my biggest complaint is, and we've talked about this. So here we are talking about the problem with three hour movies, right? Well, now, not only are these movies three hours plus, now they're so long they can't fit it in one movie. So now they're ending on a cliffhanger and saying, come back for part two. And that pisses me off. Yeah. At the end of Fast X and another movie later on my list, Mission Impossible, you're kind of getting into it and you're like, okay, this is silly, stupid, fun. And then to be continued. And I got angry. Like, really? You can't? contain a fast and furious movie in one movie did, did you feel the same way with infinity wars it's, that was too no weird. not necessarily because i i i was actually with the infinity war movies they didn't need endgame uh, personally i thought the way infinity war ended was so brilliant like came out of left field was a punch to the gut and if they would have ended like that i would have been fine with it i i felt like I felt like Endgame undid what made yeah. Infinity War so great. So I didn't I didn't necessarily feel like the story was unfinished and had to be continued in part two. I thought Infinity War was a great standalone movie. Endgame mm-hmm. is appropriately named. It's the end it's the beginning of the end for Marvel. Right, right. <laughs> in their in their phase four Hindenburg. Yeah. <laughs> now Fast X and Mission Impossible are not standalone movies. Nope. Both of them are have their fans. Now I have to defend Mission Impossible, Joe. It's in the title, man. It says Part One, <laughs> Dead Reckoning Part One. Yeah. So yeah. I get Fast X. Like you walked in there, like, hey, what the heck? Yeah. It says Dead Rec. It says Dead Reckoning Part One, Joe. Come on. Do they? My point is, do they need to split it over two movies? That no. Sure. Okay. That could be a thing. Yes. And here's the weird thing too: is Fast X has evolved to become Mission Impossible. When I watched the new Dead Reckoning Mission Impossible, I felt like it was striving to be Fast and <laughs> Furious because there's this one scene, and I hope this doesn't ruin it for anyone, but they're on this moving train, and someone's got a gun, and somebody said they're ready to pull the trigger, and Ethan Hunt comes flying in through the window at the exact right moment. Yeah. To, and I'm like, what the hell is what? this? Yeah. You're better than this Mission Impossible. Yeah, you sh- that really pissed me off, and that was very Fast and Furious. Yeah, of all the things, yeah, he jumps off the top of the mountain. <laughs> he's, he's going in the parachute. I'm like, you hit a moving train At through a window without right dying moment. to kick. Yeah, I was like, oh. that really bugged me. I, I, I did see that in the theater, and I like, I liked it. I, I think the Mission Impossible movies have been pretty good. They um, have been very, very they, entertaining. They have. Tom it, Cruise yeah. is like one of the last great movie yes. stars. He's in the fact trying that to pick up where Jackie stuff. Chan left off, and I'm like, Tom, you will die. Yeah. <laughs> you need no, to stop. I, I want to, if Tom Cruise, if you're listening, thank you yeah. for giving the movie going audience what they want, knowing that he's doing, he's clinging to the outside of a, a, a plane. And there's that one moment where he, he dives off the mountain or whatever, and he's trying to have a conversation. And his skin is flapping and it, you kind of, you're scrutinizing it going, is this a green screen effect? And then the camera kind of pulls away from him. And I'm like, Oh my God. Like he's delivering dialogue as he's falling off the face of this cliff. That gave me goosebumps. I'm yeah. getting goosebumps now. Yeah. So Tom Cruise delivers. He commits. I'm, this man broke his ankle on a jump in a previous movie in, in mm-hmm. mission impossible yeah. and carried on with the scene. I was like, oh. yeah, the so, I, you know, I don't want to come across as if I'm really, I don't, I'm not really criticizing the Mission Impossible movies. They've all been very entertaining, but I do feel that the makers of Mission Impossible feel that they need to compete with Fast and Furious. And and here's the weird thing. There are scenes in Fast X that are shot in the exact same location that Mission Impossible was yeah. filmed in, in Italy. There's a scene in Fast X where they're running from this stupid bomb in Italy. And I'm like, oh my God, those look like the exact same location. So... They're sort of competing with each other now, but yeah. Yeah. Hey, you want to have a good action time? Watch John Wick Four, Fast X, <laughs> and Dead Reckoning back to back to back. That's that's like hyper caffeinated. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh my god, I, I wouldn't be able to get any sleep that night. Um, you guys, Fast and Furious fans at all? You, you don't get into the franchise? I don't think I've ever. Honestly, I've not, I didn't even see the first one. I haven't wow. seen. I've, see, I've seen the. I've seen the me. first one. I've seen the one when they all came back, which is technically the fourth one. It's yeah, Fast and Furious. Yeah, yeah, and then I didn't see anything until Furious Seven because Paul Walker. Yeah, that's why I wanted to see that one. Yeah, and then that's it. So I've seen maybe like four total. I've I will say this: if if you were to say to me, Joe, 
if I were to watch one Fast and Furious movie, what would it be? I would probably say the first one, but most people agree that the fifth one where they introduce The Rock is the best film of the franchise. Because they were still stealing things. Yeah. At least yeah. in that movie. They, they were they, still that was things. a big bank heist sort of a thing. Yeah. And again, they defy physics. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson would just have an aneurysm watching these movies. Like, that's not how physics work. But, um, but I think he's 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 more forgiving of those movies because those are schlock. <laughs> but you show him stuff like Gravity. <laughs> you you start showing science movies, and he will yeah. you will you will see a different side of Neil deGrasse Tyson that yeah. you do not want. So yeah, <laughs> if if you if you're up for it, watch uh, Fast Five. Uh, it's yeah. very very entertaining and has one of the greatest fight scenes in the history of film when uh, Vin Diesel and The Rock go toe to toe. It, that's worth the price of admission. That's another, but the, uh, instead of a movie bringing everyone, that's another franchise that that's had everybody show up in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been great casting, and and the reason these movies are so uh, successful is the diversity. That it, it's it's just a wide range of Hispanics and African Americans and Caucasians and Asian, uh, and it appeals to everybody in every country, and that's why these movies are so successful, and that's. One of the reasons I applaud these movies is they're giving people what they want. Mm -hmm. So I, I recommend them. I enjoy them. But, they, they, um, they flirt the line with Michael Bay status. Michael Bay's like, yeah, you want explosions and hot women? I will give you that, sir. <laughs> give you that over and over again. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit before we go around the table and get some more movies from you guys. But I, I want to bring up a, a, one of the most anticipated movies of 2023, uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Have have you both seen Indiana Jones? Yep. Yes, I have. All right. Now, I you know talk about we we started off the podcast talking about dollar shows and being in the theater when I was a kid. The memory I have of Raiders of the Lost Ark was my mom taking the four kids, uh, me, my brother, and my two sisters into the dollar show, walking into Raiders of the Lost Ark halfway through grabbing a seat, watching the second half of Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> sitting through a second movie, which I don't remember, and then staying to watch the first half of Raiders. So I saw Raiders backwards, <laughs> part the second half first. Um, I think Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of the greatest movies ever made, definitely top mm -hmm. five for me. On the um, list. Yeah, and now Temple of Doom came out for me. It was a bit of a disappointment. Then when Last Crusade came out, I just thought it captured all the excitement and fun of the first one. I really loved Last Crusade. That's where I will leave Indy. That's right. my. That's where for me I last saw Doctor Jones. Yeah, I don't know what happened after that. Then Crystal Skull comes out. I don't. Know it was really about. anticipated. I saw it in a the theater, and it tops my list of one of the worst movies I've ever seen. So I went into Dial of Destiny, you know, unenthusiastic, but hoping for the best, and. My reaction as the credits were rolling was, well, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. Um, I thought some of the CGI was some of the worst I've ever seen in a film. There was at one point where it looked like Harrison Ford's face was coming off, the young version of him. Um, and the other odd thing is you're, you're hearing a grizzled old Harrison Ford with, you know, like a 35 or 40-year-old face. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so... In the end, like I said, I didn't hate it. It's in my top 10, again, due to lack of competition. But I hope it's done. I hope it's over. I hope they put it to rest. Yeah, um, I think it is. They're Joe, not worthy of I'm the I'm going to accuse trilogy. you of delving, of diving into your Raiders of the Lost Ark bank to pour some credit on to Dial of Destiny. <laughs> like you're, <laughs> you're robbing from Peter to pay Paul here. Yeah. Because I think the love for what you have for Indiana Jones and the, what I think that's like, hey, we got a fluff. Because Dial of Destiny was, I when I heard they were making another one, I said, "Don't be with Harrison. If you want to make it, look, it belongs to the mouse. They can do whatever they want with it. You want you want to reboot it? Reboot it. I'm fine with it. That's the whole, you paid money for it. That's what are you going to do? Buy it and put it on the shelf and not make money? That's very anti. Well, it, it didn't make money. <laughs> no, no, it didn't because they decided to go get Harrison again. Yeah, I was like, why? Leave the man alone. Yeah, I don't want to see geriatric. I already had this. Nonsense with the fourth movie. Thank God Men in Black neuralized myself from that fourth movie. I can only say that part. <laughs> I wish I could. The uh, spotless uh, I don't know mind. what you're talking about. The uh, <laughs> what was, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yep. I wish I could go in there and go, okay, I want to erase uh, yep. that movie. I neuralized myself. I last saw Dr. Indiana Jones and his dad and Sala and Marcus yeah. riding off of the sunset. That 
what were they doing with Dial of Destiny? Why? Yeah, and, you know, I saw something the other day that brought up a good point. And I don't know if this is just a Disney thing or Hollywood in general, but why do they take our heroes that we grew up with, like Luke Skywalker, and make them grizzled, bitter old men? Like, couldn't any of them succeeded and became heroic later in life? It was so hard to see Indiana Jones, this grizzled old man at this university, like, Come on, he, he he deserved a better ending than that. Or if you want, if you want him to end it, he went out taking out the last bit of the Fourth Reich that was stopping. You know, that's where Jones <laughs> yeah. would be. Or give him a happy life. Do one of the other. Do, go out like a hero. Go out like the champ that you are. Yeah. Or give the man a happy life that he's earned. And it seems like the last two Indiana Jones movies were really set up to try to pass the baton onto the next generation. And uh, in Crystal Skull, they were hoping that Mutt. Uh, what's the actor's name? Shia, Shia, LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf. They were hoping he was going to be the next Indiana Jones, and he, he was not. Now they're hoping Fleabag is going to be the next Indiana and Jones. And she's not. And like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Let's end it. Let's, if you want to make her, but she had, she was a decent character. Yeah. Right. If she, if that was, if she had a standalone movie with her and her friend, yeah. her short round that she was going for, do it. Yeah. If she was one of Doctor Jones's students, and if you want to go with that tangible. Do or, it. or yeah. like a six episode Disney series. Whatever, with make her. money. I, I yeah. Think yeah, that might be safer than a yeah I, than a film. <laughs> now I didn't find her character likable, and that's a big thing for me because think about this: there was a moment in the film when she tried to steal the Dial of Destiny from Indiana Jones. She left him to die. Yeah, she left him to get killed by those people who came into the building. And I couldn't get over that the rest and she of the And gl- they glossed over that part. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I knew you'd get out. I'm like, She's what? She's not likable at all. But and you, I can't root for an unlikable character. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind unlikable characters. Sometimes they're the flavor that you add. And like, I want to see you get your ear come up. And so I want to see how you're going to do it. But you, the backstory with that character, how, oh, you grew up with my friend who I only met you now. I'm like, I don't remember you in any of the <laughs> other things that, that Indy was doing. But now you're here. I'm like, okay. And yeah. the Dial of Destiny... That wasn't your target. You stumbled upon it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and she wanted it just to resell it. Like, it wasn't even a noble cause. Like, And then Indy wants to stay in the past. I'm like, this doesn't fit the character. Like, yeah, yeah. I I have to neuralize myself again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so those, those are some movies that are in my top 10 at 23, just by process of elimination. Uh, imagine those, Pete. Throw some titles at me that we might might not have touched on. That when you think twenty twenty three, what movies jump out at you besides the ones we've already talked about? No, that's pretty much it. The ones you talked and Haunting okay. in Venice because I didn't okay. go to the movies and there was nothing that really motivated me to come and go and watch these movies. There's some art. There's some indie dramas that came out, and I'm like, I'm not in an indie drama mood. Yeah, like yeah. I have to be very motivated to go see one of those type of movies, like My Mother's yeah. Castle or something. There's always some pretentious title. Yeah, I'll I'll, <laughs> My I'll wait to. I'll yeah. wait to see what gets nominated That's for Oscars. That's a real Oscars. movie, I think. Uh, <laughs> whatever gets nominated for an Oscar, I'll make an attempt to see, but I'll wait till yeah. then. Andrew, any movies we've left off that uh, really jump I, out at you from I, I had just briefly mentioned before on here, it's really extremely disturbing movie called Bo is Afraid uh, with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, directed by the guy who directed Midsummer and Hereditary. I, not your type of movie, Joe, I know, but yeah. there's something about this movie that is so... Unique hmm. is one way to put it. You talking about Napoleon? No, no. A bow is afraid. A bow is afraid. Okay. Remind me. Did you see it? No, I have not seen that oh. one. Really? Nick, I would love to see your opinion. It's, oh, I'm... it's also it's it's three hours long. Oh, come on! But this this movie this movie is like <laughs> another one. It's it's like a bad mushroom or acid trip. I swear. I... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like this this movie is trying to give you uh like. An, Anxiety attack, like like why like, would you do that? I, yeah. I, I, you, yeah. It's like you invite me to your house and like I'm going to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> but but no, mind. but you'll see in the first like 15, 20 minutes what I'm talking about. Okay, and it's 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 surreal. Like the movie, like these things happen to Joaquin Phoenix's character. That you're like, how is this possible that these things happen? I will I will add that to my list. Um. If you want someone else, one of the few other people that I know that saw it who can vouch for it is uh, John Ross. Ross, him, okay. Him and I have texted about that All movie right, like I will have to 30 ta- times. <laughs> I'll have to talk to Ross about this. Um, so, I, yeah, Bo's Afraid. Um, t- real quick, two other horrors. Yeah. So I'm a big horror guy. Talk to me. 
which is an indie Australian film. It's a possession film about like a hand. Okay. That these uh, college kids play with at a party, mm-hmm. and then people start dying and mm-hmm. stuff. And um, very original a cast of people I've never heard of before, but they hit it on every note. Mm-hmm. It kind of makes sense. Ignorant college people playing with mythical <laughs> items. You should like, hey, should we play with Dracula's fangs? I, I wouldn't, but you know, go on you go because what could happen? Uh, uh, real quick, another um, horror, but was also a little more kind of funny. Uh, was Megan? It was the uh, yeah. animatronic doll AI. Yeah, that was a pretty doll, big hit. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, with Allison Williams. Okay. Um, I saw it in the theater, and I was like. Pleasantly surprised. All right. Fairly original. Yeah. Um, and then my last one that I had on my, on my list came came out on Netflix, directed by David Fincher, starring Michael, Michael Fassbender called The Killer. Yes. A, an excellent modern noir movie about a hitman. Mm-hmm. Now, it's heavy on uh, the voiceover dialogue, like, because there's very little actual dialogue. Fassbender doesn't say anything for the first 17 minutes. You, you saw it. Yeah, right? I saw okay. it. <laughs> so, but- well, it, he didn't Excellent. say anything on right. screen, yeah. Excellent. Sounds like Excellent. it could be up my alley. I might check Excellent. that out. That's, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of a slow burn. Yeah, it's a little bit. Like some David Fincher movies because, are, but they, it, it's... I just find it, well, the one part about the movie I find someone's like, I'm shocked that people come after him. Like, you failed in a mission, man. What did you think? You live in a world of killers. I can't believe they'd come after the one thing that matters to me. I'm like, I would. That's what I would do because you're a killer. How else do I... I want to ask you guys something. You know what we haven't talked about in this year? No animated films. Oh. No Pixar's. No nothing. Even, even the mouse came up with some movies that didn't really crack. Them. I'm trying to yeah. think of the last time I watched an animated feature. They, there's I've always one that. Some of those. There's always one that breaks the list. That's like it gets in the yeah, top yeah. ten for the year. But no up. Yeah. No nothing. No. Yeah, I, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, there might be some stuff in 2024 we're going to talk about, but a uh, couple other titles. I don't want to really get into much detail, but uh, they're on my top ten. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy wrapped mm-hmm. up with Volume Three. It was okay. Again, yeah. I liked it. Didn't love it. Yep. I, um, same here. I saw it in the theater, the least of the three movies, but it was still right. good and, and it, enjoyable. Yeah, it, 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 and it hit. It, it, it hit the notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's also carrying some of that Phase Four taint in it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of Phase Four taint, uh, Black <laughs> Panther, uh, Wakanda Forever. Uh, I sat down to watch. I didn't see it in the theater. I watched it at streaming. At first, I liked it. It was pretty emotional at the beginning when they acknowledged that yeah. Black Panther had passed away. But then it took some liberties, and I'm like, what? Like, you know, they, there was this race of undersea people that, you know, is, threatens the Wakanda. And what do they do? They decide to challenge them on the water, their home turf. Wakanda, well, how do you think this is going to go? I thought Wakanda was landlocked. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Yeah. I when know. I look at the map, I'm like, I thought Wakanda's landlocked. Yeah, Even like in the Mar- MC, I'm like, so where's the ocean coming so, in on this? It, I, did, I didn't see the second one. So I, That'd be like I Namor having a problem with Kansas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I would pick what, a fight really? with yeah, the Midwest. I hate Nebraska. I'm like, oh, okay, on you go. What? So It's a shame that the movie is so forgettable. You don't hear it. I bet you when I brought it up, you guys were like, oh, yeah, that came out this year. Yeah. Um, just... Disappen- a disappointing sequel to the original, but like I said, it's on my top ten only because it was a weak year for movies. Now, I don't like to be too negative, but I want to throw out some of my most hated films of 2023. Uh, I am sick and tired of the multiverse. I can't take it anymore. I know people are raving about this, this animated Spider-Man movie, which is an yeah. animation movie that there a lot go. of people That's saw. True. Yeah, Spider-Man. Um, now, I, I can't say it's a good or a bad movie. I'm just sick of of the multiverse. I can't take it anymore. I sat down to watch Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and even though technically that wasn't necessarily multiverse, but that was this microverse that they went in with the save a that race of people. I just movie. didn't give any, I, I didn't care about. I thought it was just awful. The Flash yeah. was one of the worst pieces of garbage. I, I was excited about Michael Keaton making a return as Batman. He's about the only good um, thing in that movie. Yeah. And, that, and Supergirl. That movie just went off the rails and just got worse and worse and worse as it progressed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, I've seen people online go, I kind of liked it. And I'm like, block. 
<laughs> Anyone who likes the Flash, don't listen to this podcast. You're not invited to sit down with us. You don't know movies. That's like going to a, a four star restaurant and ordering chicken fingers. Like, knock it off. The Flash was terrible. Are they the ones who drink the finger bowl because it's soup? <laughs> like, yeah, his soup was great. It's all lemony. I'm like, get out. Get out. Uh, the first uh, Meg movie with Jason Statham, I saw that in the theater when it came out, and I thought it was just silly, brainless fun. You're going to make me drink tonight. The second <laughs> one is awful. The second one is unwatchable. That's, that's what I heard. I, I, I didn't have like any expectations for either movie. I, yeah. I heard people that saw the first one, like, it, it was fun for what it was. Yeah. But then they said the second one was just it was oh. it was trash. It, and it reminded me that the Chinese have just as many flaws as Americans <laughs> in making movies. When they want to make a movie for the Chinese audience, uh, so that that was a Chinese production. Yeah, that, okay. that's, yeah. I don't know anything about either. Movie no, no, because that's how they were, and that's what happened. That's why in the first movie, when you watch it, they're like, "Oh, why did they go to a Chinese?" Resort? It's not anything in the novel. The mm-hmm. novel actually try was an homage to Jaws. Oh. And the novel did well. When I heard they were going to make this in the movie, I thought, oh, this could be the 21st century Jaws. You could do to them what, this, what they're in. Like, no, we're making an action schlock. I'm like, Jason Statham. I'm like, yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I, all right. uh, think about this. Sitting at home by myself, bored, turning on the, the Meg and turning it off about 20 minutes into it, going, this is trash. Oh, so you um, didn't finish it? No. It was, oh. aw- it was that bad. It was that awful. When, <laughs> when you got people walking along the bottom of the Mariana Trench in these yeah. skin-tight pressure suits having a conversation with each other, I'm it like, gets, uh, it you, gets I'm worse. gone. <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw the... I, I, oh I, went through, I went through the black hole, oh, and I emerged brutal. broken and, and, <laughs> and, and distraught. You had to go to the ER afterwards. No, ER's like, get out. ER's like, I can see that stink on you. Get out. Now, another movie that was released late in 2022 that uh, a lot of people didn't see till 2023, I found offensive. It made me physically nauseous, uh, the movie Babylon. I couldn't get past the, the opening 10 minutes of the movie. It made me sick. And... It has Margot Robbie in it and what, Brad, Brad, Brad Pitt. Pitt. And like yeah. I was very optimistic. It's directed by uh, Damien Chazelle, who did, yeah, La La who La did La La Land, which you love. Yeah, and I, someone described it as La La Land on crack or something. And I'm like, I don't know what, about was that. It, was it? I, Crystal I, meth. Without spoiling too much, because I might want to see it someday. Is it just a movie of all about like the a- excess? Well, of, I didn't like, get that far. That's oh, you what didn't it, watch the That's what it's kind of about. It's about you know the golden age even maybe pre-golden age of hollywood where they were just gods and they you know it was like a roman empire or whatever caligula but the first 10 minutes are so horrific and i I don't want to say it on the podcast and i I don't want to encourage anyone to go watch it go what is he talking about um but i couldn't get past the 10 minutes and i was it made me physically ill you just did an i-75 car wreck they're going to go gawk at it now. I know. I know. I got to see where it's streaming yeah. tonight. No, what is this, what is this awful nightmare you. that he's talking about? It, Joe, it, I'll watch Babylon. You watch Bo is Afraid, I, and then we'll talk. <laughs> I can't have both of you go down. I will, <laughs> this, I'll, let me sign a disclaimer so you can't come back and say, you made me watch it. Um, so I hated that movie. And then for me, the most disappointing movie of the year was The Fablemans. I'm a huge Steven Spielberg fan. I was really excited about I this movie. I felt bad for you, knowing how much you love Steven Spielberg yeah. and what this movie was meant to be and supposed to be. And then when you told me, I almost, I felt bad. Yeah. I walked out of it. I, I saw it in a the theater. I walked out of it about halfway through, maybe a little bit more than halfway. I wanted some insight into the wonder and magic that made Spielberg Spielberg. And what we got was sort of a, a generic family drama about anti-Semitism and a crazy mother and a, a, a dysfunctional family. And I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. And I just, when I got to the scene where a schoolmate of Steven Spielberg, even though they didn't use the name Spielberg, uh, when she was like trying to convert him to Christianity or whatever, I'm, I was like, all right. I was like a Vegas dealer. I'm out. Someone else come and take my seat. I'm gone. That's not what I signed up for. I would have lost money in Vegas. Someone came to me, Nick. I'm gonna I'm gonna bet you that Joe walks out of a Steven Spielberg movie <laughs> as a fan. I'm like, I, I'll take that bet, sir. Yeah. You just lost me a hundred dollars. I'm like, wait, what? He yeah. walked out. When? Yeah, it was in the first ten minutes. <laughs> it was my most disappointing movie of the year, and and why they didn't call it the Spielbergs, I, I'll never understand because. 
I watched a Spielberg documentary later. Yeah. And there were references in the documentary that referred to very specific scenes in the Fableman. So why create this fictional family when they've already done the documentary? It was an autobiography, basically. So that alone is confusing. But um, yeah, yeah, I was disappointed. Sorry, Stephen. We'll see what he does next. I haven't heard what his next project is. Yeah. We'll see. He might be getting up there. This might be the thing where, yeah, you know, know, it's like, what else do you want to do? Unless it's, it's got to be 73 or 74. He's getting up there. And, no, and, no, I'm not saying he should retire, but I think yeah, yeah, what yeah. other stories do you want to tell? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, well. I, well, the last one that I also was disappointed with was West Side Story. Like, I tried yeah. watching West Side Story, and I understand why he made it. He wanted to have Hispanic actors in Hispanic roles, unlike the first version of West Side Story. But the first version was such a classic. A remake was unnecessary. Yeah. And so that was another movie, shockingly. I, I turned off about 30 minutes into it. I'm like, this is unnecessary. Which one? A Star is Born with the one with um, uh, Lady Bradley Gaga. Cooper. And, when they keep remaking that movie yeah. over and over yeah, again. Fourth or fifth I've only seen that. That version, and I I really liked it, but I, I know that was it. at least the third time that yeah. Movie's and been. The, that storyline has been told before because the artist, which was a Best Picture winner, was basically a star is born. Uh, so oh, yeah, they yeah, keep, the the silent film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I saw that in theater too. Yeah, yeah, and they keep telling that story over and over. But um, yeah. So even though I think Steven Spielberg is the greatest director of my generation, uh, there's been a couple of duds that I just didn't care for. Hey, Belichick lost Super Bowls. That happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, now, uh, I guess we can quickly get into this. Uh, let's talk about our most anticipated movies of 2024. Now, one thing that was a little disappointing for me is I I looked at a couple articles that said, okay, what are people looking forward to in 2024? And one list that I saw that had like 20 titles on it, every single title was a reboot, remake, prequel, sequel, Nothing was an original film. And I'm like, oh, no, 2024 is going to be the year of reboots and remakes. And that was very, very disappointing. Now, having said that, there are a few that I'm looking forward to. Number one on my list that I'm looking forward to this year is Deadpool 3. Mm -hmm. I thought the first two Deadpool movies were great. Yeah, it's going to be great movies. And and knowing that Wolverine, Hugh Jackman is going to be in this, this could be this could go down as one of the greatest trilogies of all time. Where does Deadpool rank on your most anticipated films of twenty twenty four? It was the very first one I wrote down. There you go for my anticipated section. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking yes. forward to that. Maybe we can do an outing and go yes, go see yes, that. Yes. Uh, another sequel that maybe not as much as Deadpool three, but I'm kind of looking forward to possibly the sequel to Beetlejuice. Yep, Beetlejuice that's on my two, list. Yep, uh, coming out September six. Uh, Winona Ryder's coming back, who was great on Stranger Things. Oh yeah, Michael Keaton returns as Beetlejuice, uh, joined by Jenna Ortega, who uh, Ortega, who's the current flavor of the moment right now. Everyone yep. loves Jenna. Connected Ortega. with another uh, Tim Burton project, Wednesday. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Which I heard was good, but and I haven't so seen it. so she plays series, yeah. Lydia's daughter, which I think is intriguing. So you looking forward to yes, I Beetlejuice? Am. Very much. Now, uh, another sequel that's coming out that I, I wasn't really blown away with the previous version of this, but um, we're getting a sequel to Ghostbusters, uh, Frozen Empire, March yeah. 29th. Ghostbusters Afterlife was okay. It, it, it kind of paid homage to the original Ghostbuster movies and treated it with respect and it was okay but um we'll see I'll I'll I'm sure I'll be in the theater to see the sequel and hope for the best you guys excited about Ghostbusters at all I didn't see the the afterlife I didn't see afterlife or the one with the the women I've only oh, I've no, only no, 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 I've no, only no. actually seen the very first and you're fine. There's that, nothing your, wrong with it. If you're then you're perfectly fine. Yeah, the first one is all of the the only one you really need. Yeah, to don't see. need to see the second one. Really? Nah, nah. the second oh. one was okay, but it was Bill Murray said that Ghostbusters two is the reason he doesn't do sequels anymore. Yeah, oh. yeah, oh, okay, because they're, they're always disappointing. All right. Um, another sequel that came out of the blue, and I'm really shocked by this, Gladiator two. Yeah, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, I'm like, uh, Maximus is gone, right? Yeah. So apparently this is going to be Commodus, Commodus nephew goes in search for his uh, f- biological father. And so I, 
it, it, the character's name is Lucius Varus, played by Paul Mescal. I don't know who that is. Um, but I, Gladi- He's the, the young boy in, in Gladiator. Okay. So Gladiator, I think, even though right now it's not on my 100 greatest movie list, but it probably should be. But Gladiator is fantastic. It was just great. So I am intrigued about a sequel to Gladiator. Is it necessary? No. But am I intrigued? Yes. Um, another movie coming out November 27th. I'm sort of intrigued by, but I'm going to kind of wait and see what critics have to say about it. Uh, Wicked is finally getting the movie treatment. Now, again... They're already announced they're splitting it into multiple parts. So the first one is Wicked Part 1. I've never seen the theatrical production. Yeah, I know either. people who have. I'm a big Wizard of Oz fan. So, again, I'm intrigued, but I'm I'm going to take sort of a, a wait-and-see attitude. Uh, a prequel that's coming out on May 24th. Again, I'm sort of intrigued by it. Anya Taylor-Joy is playing a young Furiosa. Uh, in the Mad Max prequel. It's on I, my list. I didn't love Fury Road. Really? I, I, I mm. liked it for what it was, I but it. I love the old Mad Max movies. Um, I thought the Fury Road was sort of a simple story, but I am intrigued. Mm. I like Anya Taylor-Joy. She was great in that Queen's Gambit or whatever. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's May 24th. Uh, Twister. It apparently is getting a sequel called Twisters. Why not? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Say that again? Yeah, I, I read that today, too. Twister is getting a sequel on the July The game 19th. or the movie? The, the movie. movie. <laughs> the, or or the, uh, the tornado the, movie. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. yeah we're let's, gonna... let's write a feature film about Twister. <laughs> I got a great idea. Barbie was a hit. Yes. Let's do Twister I, the movie. I'm, for those of you that can't see, I'm having a visual reaction, like that's, an allergic reaction on, on that's pretty in the funny. studio. So, yeah, the tornado movie, uh, oh, they're going to double down on climate change and oh. uh, do this sequel. Now, obviously, Bill Paxson is gone. What? I wouldn't I be surprised. Say, they, they should, oh. they should yeah. just bring him back and, you know, for CGI. Well, why right. not? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. borderline on blasphemy, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Helen Hunt has at least a cameo, but oh, um, sure. but apparently, yeah. It, it's, it's almost as if Hollywood is trying to set a record for most amount of time between a movie and its sequel or people. Yeah. Um, it's like Robo Cops. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, I'm curious how you guys feel about this next one. December 20th, live action prequel to Lion King called Mufasa. No. Uh, I didn't know this existed. Yeah. So I know what happens. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. So apparently, this sequel is about Simba and his cub going on an adventure. But the movie flashes back to a young Mufasa sowing his royal oats, so, uh, so to speak. So it's like the John Favreau Lion King live action, but 100% CGI. Yeah, even though this, this is a pet peeve of mine. They call these movies live action, even though they're CGI, which drives me absolutely insane. Uh, so I don't know. So that's coming out December 20th. We've got about a year for uh, that. Yeah. Uh, one of the more intriguing movies I think uh, announced, and this this is weird, is coming out on December twenty fifth, Nosferatu, yes. oh, starring yeah. Bill Skarsgård, who see was that. Pennywise in It. Yes. Uh, he's obsessed with uh, Lily Rose Depp, who is uh, I assume Johnny Depp's daughter. Yeah. Yep. I'm very intrigued by that. Now I'm not going to spend Christmas Day in the movie theater to watch Nosferatu, but I will get around to seeing what it. What a now. weird release date. Yeah. Why would you put Christmas? Nosferatu? Well, I, that just hit me right now when you said yeah. I was like, wait, what? Oh, man. You know, years ago, I, I had some time to kill on Christmas Day, so my sister and I used to go to see a movie on Christmas Day. And I remember her and I were standing in line to get a ticket to see Dream Girls, I think it was. And there was a family, like a mother and like four young kids in front of us. And they were like, can we get uh, five tickets for Black Christmas, which was a slasher flick. <laughs> on Christmas Day, a mother took her four young children to see a slasher flick on Christmas Day. I will never forget my, that. My favorite is seeing the first Deadpool at Great Lakes Crossing, and in front of me, in front of me was a mom with her like four year old kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck with that therapy down the road. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, this is not a theatrical release. This is a Netflix movie, but I, I am intrigued about the sequel to Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. They yeah. call it Axel oh. F. Uh, it, I find it kind of odd from what I've seen so far. Uh, Eddie Murphy comes back. He's wearing the same lines, jacket, driving the same car. Like, 
35 years later. I'm like, okay. Um, but, you know, there were rumors here in the Detroit area. People saw the crappy Chevy Nova in and around Detroit. I don't think anyone actually spotted um, um, Eddie Murphy, but they did shoot some Detroit exteriors. I'm, so I'm intrigued I'm, by that. I'm scared. I'm yeah. hoping they let Eddie be Eddie because I, I want him to be Axel because that Beverly Hills Cop 3, yeah. it didn't feel like Axel Foley. And the recent Coming to America sequel was pretty disappointing because oh. they didn't necessarily focus on Eddie. They focused on his son who was not charismatic at all. Uh, um, so we'll see how that plays out. Here's, here's a weird one that I'm kind of looking forward to. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Unfrosted, the Pop-Tart story. Written and directed by Jerry Seinfeld, oh. uh, who also, I believe, acts in it. And it's a true-to-life story uh, set in the 60s about the battle to be the first to put these toaster treats <laughs> on the market. And it sounds so ridiculous, I'm intrigued. And the fact that Jerry's... Uh, it's like, it's like the Tetris it. movie that came out on Apple. <laughs> I, 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 was, I said, how are you going to make a movie on Tetris? I'm like, well, but they, the, the angle, the approach they took was intriguing. So I'll... I want to know why they got rid of apple cinnamon pop tarts. Can anyone Those answer me that good. question? Yeah. Anyone that deserves to do that deserves to burn There's in hell. really not a bad pop tart, man. Uh, I love pop tarts. I can't stand. Uh, <laughs> uh, the last movie I want to throw out. This is uh, intriguing, and mostly because this seems like an original concept, not a sequel or a prequel. Unfortunately, it is a Netflix movie. I don't know if it'll get a theatrical release. Uh, but Millie Bobby Brown uh, stars as. Princess Alodi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, she gets betrothed to a prince, uh, and she's excited about it, uh, only to find out that uh, there's a long-time uh, tradition that uh, the bride gets sacrificed uh, to, I, I don't know, a dragon or something? I don't know. Uh, so Millie Bobby Brown is going to be the star of this film called Damsel, coming out March 8th. And I love me some Bill, Millie Bobby Brown. She's great in those Enola, Enola Holmes yeah. movies. I, I, I was looking up to see when the third one is coming out, and I, I guess they're in pre-production. They haven't started filming Enola Holmes 3 yet, but uh, seeing her outside of the Stranger Things world, she's a marvelous actress and, and has done some fun stuff. So, so that's kind of the last movie on my radar for 2024. Um, how about you guys? Can you guys add anything that you're looking forward to in 2024? Yeah. Uh, I, in the sea of reboots, uh, prequels, and all that, I saw The Book of Clarence. That's coming out. I'm really intrigued about that one that has Lakeith Stan uh, Stanfield, uh, his take on when Jesus showed up and like how they were going to... Uh, it, it, that looks like a, a, a dark comedy or at least a comedy. Who's in that? Lakeith Stanfield. He was in... Um, did, did you ever see uh, Knives Out? He was the oh, yeah, he, yeah. he was the cop, the, the lead detective, instead of... The, okay. the official policeman there, yeah. All right, and he's done he's done several others. Uh, there, there's another. This I saw the trailer for this, and it came out, and I love the title. The title alone makes me want to go see it. The American Society of Magical Negroes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw the title, but I didn't get to read. I saw it. the trailer. Oh, just, I was right, like, right. I gotta go see this. This looks incredible. There's a movie with uh, Henry Cavill called Argyle that looks like a James Bond kind of spoof. You know. All right. So. These aren't sequels, and I they might be based off some adaptation, but we'll see. So I those I, I were look I, those are the ones I was looking forward to. Dune two, part two. Ah, not a Dune guy. Not yeah, a Dune I, fan. I, I enjoyed the first one. I said, oh, you know, De uh, Denny Villeneuve took took a stab at it, so that's going. The, the movie that I'm dreading and I I'm scared because why would you do it? Is Godzilla and Kong the new empire? I'm like, what are we doing? Because the trailers are not impressive no. for that. The CGI looks unfinished to me. It, it, mm. And the story is getting weird. So weird, but which is interesting because I am enjoying Monarch legacy of monsters on Apple. It is a, I love is that, that a series. series. Yeah. It's a series. I didn't realize that Kurt Russell's in it, right? Yeah. And he does a, him and his son do huh. a phenomenal job. His no son idea. plays Kurt Russell back you know, when he was younger. Did not know that. All and right. he, it's, he sounds like his dad. He's, I was like, wow, that's like a part. Where, where's Goldie in this, <laughs> in this mix up? Interesting. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Yeah. yeah. So there at least there's a, I had to search. Like when you were mentioning this before I searched and those were like a handful of Weren't prequels, weren't sequels, weren't reboots. Yeah. So it's good to have those in there amongst the ones that I'm going to go see. Yeah. Andrew, anything you can add? Yes. Um, Joker 2 with Joaquin. Never saw the first one. I, lo uh, I we've, loved We've it. discussed this. I'm not a fan of <laughs> movies that glorify yeah. the villain. You, 
It's very dark, Joe. Yeah, yeah. you wouldn't you wouldn't like it. But yeah. anyway, I'm looking forward to that. Um, do you guys hear about the new Alien movie? Yes. So it I takes place. I heard some rumblings. It yeah. takes place between the first and second movies. Yeah. Okay. It, and it, is it Bradley? Bradley. Uh, Ridley. Sorry. Oh, Ridley. Ridley. Uh, it's not him directing. It's okay. some, well, I didn't recognize it. He was supposed to do, he did what? Covenant. What was the other one? Uh, Prometheus was. Oh Prometheus, my God. Covenant. He was I supposed to do a third one that never no? surfaced, but I found them disappointing because I went in hoping that it was going to bridge, you know, take us up to the first alien movie. And they went as far as to show that horseshoe shaped craft and everything. And I'm like, Oh, there it is. There it is. And then Ridley made a point of saying that is not the same ship from the first Alien movie. And I'm like, then why the hell did you put it in the movie? Like, what are you doing? And so I found those There's some behind-the-scenes Hollywood stuff on that. Neil Bloomkamp was working on an Aliens movie. had gone to pre-production. They had everything in there. And Ridley got scared shitless that that movie was going to probably challenge his take, him and Jim Cameron's take on there. He's like, oh, you know, I, I'm coming back. Yeah, I'm making a, I got a story. I'm, I'm going to do it. It's, yeah. it's premium. So, like, oh. so he shut it down. Yeah, because once, I, once they found Ridley, I remember was a couple back, of years ago that that uh, they were they, they were in they production. A, yeah, yeah. And once once Ridley came uh, back into into the mix, they're like, oh, well, if Ridley's back, sorry, Neil. But then it's Ridley. And then he gave it to a different director. No, no, he did Prometheus. Yeah, he directed. No, the yeah, first but two, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but but the Neil Blomkamp one, the idea I thought was after uh, Covenant. No, no, no. That was going to be before Prometheus. Oh, okay. That was coming up. People were excited. They were like, it would erase the taste of Alien 3 and uh, oh, that fourth movie. Yeah. Like, Hicks was alive. Oh, uh, they were going to. They were going to take, it would be, whatever, a couple of years after Aliens, they survived and what was going to happen because yeah. did the corporation, Will and Newtani, still keep, so that was going to happen. Yeah. Ridley comes in and says, no, 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 no. I got I got a story. We're going to do Prometheus. New see, it's just it's epic. And they're going to challenge the philosophy and everything. I was like, okay, on you go, Ridley. And like, well, what the hell is this? So this movie that you're talking about, is this is this part of that Ridley thing? Or, yeah. I mean, I'll well, go see it, but he, I'm, I, I don't know I how don't, it fits in. I don't remember the guy's name who was directing it. Yeah. But um, Fed, Fede Alvarez. I, I don't okay, know, I yeah, know who, who that is. is so. um, Covenant just doubled down on Prometheus's mistakes. And I was like, produced oh, yeah. by... Ridley Scott, so he's all right. His, so he does have his hand, in and it's thing. his production company, Scott okay. Scott Free Productions. It's being put out, or yeah, distributed by 20th Century. So hopefully, it's decent. we'll see. I'll be there. Um, yeah, I'm still going to watch it. Yeah, I saw yeah. Covenant, and I was like, oh, I gotta go see Covenant. Don't yeah. don't kick me in the balls. Either. <laughs> I don't remember if you guys had seen or liked uh, the first two, uh, A Quiet Place, A Quiet Places. Yeah. Oh, nah. I tried watching the first one and I I couldn't do it when when she snagged that nail and it went straight up. Oh, I, I, oh yeah. I said I'm out. I can't do this. So they're doing a third one. Um, I think it's called like Day One. So it shows like of oh, that, that's you know, like a, a, that's a that, that's like the Sandra Bullock movie. Uh, where everyone's wearing a bird, blindfold. Bird. Bird, bird box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, then now it's bird box, bird box, and other parts. That, like there's one in. in um, Madrid or something or Spain, so I got to watch it. I mean, I'm intrigued, but right. day one, okay, yeah. Are I they, thought they kind of touched on it in Quiet Place too when they show the them driving in the car. Scene. Yeah, but that was just the first like couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now it's the now it's the first. Now it's the okay. first two and a half bring hours. Back Krasinski and no, or is it just no, a new, new uh, characters? L- Lupita Nyong'o is going to oh, be. It follows a different family then. Yeah, but um, uh, the guy who's in the second one uh, was his name. Uh, Jiman Hansu. Yeah, Jiman Hansu. Yeah. I don't. I don't remember how to pronounce his name. Uh, he's going to be in it. Okay. So mm-hmm. anyway, the last th- movie I'll mention, and I don't know if you guys had heard of it. The trailer just came out. It's called Civil War. It's directed by yeah. the guy who did uh, Ex Machina and Annihilation, which were two of my favorite movies of the yeah. past, like I don't know, eight years. I saw that trailer. So uh, <laughs> Nick, about? Nick Offerman plays the president, and. Mm. It, it looks like it it could be just like two or three years from now, but America is in like a real life civil war. I, I think someone like, I think I'm someone intrigued. wrote this, someone wrote this movie with Trump in mind. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, okay. and over the radio you hear California and Texas have just seceded from the unit, Ooh. joining seventeen other states or something. Ooh. And then you see airstrikes and interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> all right, that but yeah, it's just it's just called civil war. Okay. Yep. 
That's, that's one I'll, I'll wait and see what people say about it, but I'm intrigued. Everything that guy has done before, um, and especially Annihilation. Uh, yeah, so I'll that watch movie it. Was but I just, I just I just thought when they said Texas and California, the Texas was like, what? And California? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm out. Uh, yeah, we hate you. Yeah, it's like once you see this movie, like what are the re- you know what's the reason why this is happening? What yeah. would it take you for know? California and Texas to be on the same ideological page? But, oh, I don't think they but, would be. See, think you don't you don't know. They'd be forming their own government. All they said that they've. Succeeding, succeeding. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they're aligned. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. think about what happened in the Balkans in the nineties. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they've been there've been some short stories where the, like the the Midwest collective, like, what if the Midwest said, you know what, you guys, you guys are crazy, we're out. Oh, by the way, we have all the water. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> we have all the fresh water. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. Have fun. We signed a deal with Canada. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> they talk about that. Like, imagine the hit the the GDP of the United States would take if California seceded and became its own country. It's like, so, it, yeah, it it's, 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 a, but, it's like the fifth or sixth largest GDP. If it were its own country. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, I'm intrigued. Is there any more, uh, Andrew? That's I'm good for, for movies. All right. So let's hope, you know, these movies get us back in the theaters. I hope some uh, surprise us. I, I hope the ones that I'm excited about, I hope they don't disappoint. And I'm looking forward to getting back in the theater mm-hmm. again. And, and if something and... comes along the line that piques our interest, it, we'll shove an entire episode for yeah. it. <laughs> something pops up. So what you can expect from us, you know, over the course of the next several months is we're going to have themed episodes where we're going to talk about specific genres, maybe our, our favorite movie lines, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. And and uh, we're just going to talk movies. That's something I love doing, whether we're on the air or not. And I'm going to try and get to Joe to confess to more of the secrets. He, this man knows things, people. <laughs> He's not telling you, but he knows things. So... That kind of winds Come down our inaugural episode. And uh, thank you for listening. We're going to like leave you with this cute little song about going to the movies. And guys, thanks for joining me on uh, this first episode of Hollywood Blockbuster. It's a pleasure. And we'll see you again you. in a couple of weeks. Good night, everybody. Come to the movies and try to laugh your troubles away. Dream of the places you wanted to go They seem to be so real And if you want to get away from it all Come to the movies, give me a call